Freedom isn't free, it's Veterans Day. The breakdown starts now. Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. This is The Rick Wilson. And today we salute our veterans. Rick, I, I know that uh, you and I often talk about my grandfather and I on the show, I, yep. I honor my, my gramps all the time. And he, he passed away at 90 in 2016. And we spent some time Memorial Day um, talking about my grandfather mm -hmm. and the significance of poppies. But Veterans Day is different than Memorial Day. And sometimes people conflate the two and it's important to distinguish between them. And today we celebrate everyone who is currently serving and who has ever served. Yep. And um, I just think that it's it's important that we don't forget them. I know that a lot of our a lot of our, our veterans and, and some of our military folks feel like too many times it's convenient for politicians to use them as pawns um, when, you know, to they wrap themselves in the flag and support our troops. And but then when, you know, they come home and there's issues once they they're off the battlefield that, that they get left behind. And I think it's important on this Veterans Day that we salute them. And we also know that they are not forgotten Absolutely. and that their their service and sacrifice is um, to be celebrated and honored. It really is, Tara. And I, I want to say that, you know, this is an organization we've been blessed to have some terrific vet American veterans on our staff and on our mm -hmm. team uh, in the last couple in the last year and a half. And it's an honor to work with them. And it's an honor to to understand how deeply woven into the fabric of American society, you know, uh, the values and the virtues of America's servicemen and women are uh, how, how integral they are to our society. Absolutely. And as we start the show tonight, we want to continue with our uh, service honoring those are those men and women who have served and show you what Lincoln Project did last year. And we are re-upping it this year as well to say thank you. Take a look. Since the dawn of our nation, brave citizens have answered the call to arms when the country was in danger. We hold our veterans in reverence for their courage, their sacrifice, and their honor and service to their fellow Americans. Generations of Liberty's sons and daughters have gone into harm's way, manned the battlements, and sailed the seas to preserve freedom for all. Our nation owes a debt of gratitude we can never repay to those who have chosen to answer the call to arms. Today, we honor them and thank them for their service, for their dedication to our nation's preservation, and for their oath to the Constitution on which the foundation of our government rests. On this Veterans Day, we ask all Americans to honor the over 18 million veterans among us and thank them for their continued dedication to our country, our freedom, and our future. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. Well done, well done, well done. Um, and in the in the spirit of that, we wanted also to talk a little bit about uh, wrapping this all together. The talking about the uh, some of the candidates who are running, some some veterans that the Democrats um, have running in some key districts going into twenty twenty two. Because it's you know we look at this, Rick, and we we see these For people sure. who not only serve their country in the military, but now they want to serve again as public servants, as elected representatives. And you know you and I talk about this on the show all the time about the importance of candidate selection. Um, know, you know, know your district, pick Candidate the right quality people. Is, uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Candidate quality matters and it matters, especially for Democrats where, where there's an offsetting, you know, look, the Republican strategy is to portray every Democrat as a radical socialist, communist, cannibal, whatever. Right. Um, and it's a lot harder for them <laughs> when the men and women who've been in the service to the United States in the, in the military um, on the Democratic side, run for office. And it vexes Republicans tremendously. It makes them crazy because, you know, the chicken hawk party over there <laughs> will have a lot of people who will talk tough about Al-Qaeda um, and, 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 and China and other things. But the, they're, they're, there's often a gap between the, the loud talk and the service. And so, you know, we've got, a, we've got a lot of Democratic candidates coming up in the process this time. And I think Sean Patrick Maloney deserves a lot of credit for helping mm -hmm. recruit many of those uh, as head of the D-Trip right now. I think he's done a tremendous job at that. 
For those who don't speak Washington, the, the D trip, the D triple C is the Democratic Congressional uh, Campaign Committee. It's the RNC's counterpart, NRCC's counterpart. And uh, they're responsible for uh, recruiting and helping to raise money for to get their candidates elected in Congress. So, um, yeah. And the thing about it is there's a couple of, of folks that we wanted to highlight that we that we pointed out one of them, Marcus Flowers, he was going to join us tonight, except that his father unfortunately passed away. And so we send our condolences to Marcus on that front. Um, he is a U.S. Army combat veteran and he is running against Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, a lot of people think it's a long shot, obviously, which is a shame. <laughs> um, but he uh, he raised a good amount of money, though, Rick. He raised like one point three million dollars the last yep. quarter, which is nothing to sneeze at. That's a lot for, a, you know, a shit kicking congressional district in Georgia. Listen, I, I got to say this. I got to say this. Marcus, for a Democrat. I, I, I have tremendous respect for Marcus. It is a very tough seat to win. But if anyone deserves to have somebody come in there who's an actual American patriot, as opposed to a, a, a batshit crazy lunatic Karen um, from, from Magistan, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is that person. And, and I hope Marcus says it has, runs a great campaign. And I hope he keeps up the pressure on her as we go forward. Yes. And I hope that we get a chance to get him on. I know he wants to come and join us. Yeah. So, yeah. Regrets um, about his father passing. Absolutely. That's terrible. And, and obviously uh, our thoughts are with him and his family. Indeed. He has an open invitation anytime. Absolutely. Uh, there's a couple others. We have um, uh, Matt Costelli. He's a former CIA and NSC guy. He's running against um, that other one, that Elise Stefanik up there in New York 21. Yeah. He's another one. I know. He, she... You know, she was on Harvard kicked her kicked her off the the uh, IOP advisory board after she decided to go to join uh, the ranks of, in Magistan. Um, but this guy, you know, he again, it's know your district. If there's anyone that can give her a run for a month for her money, it's this guy because if you look at his resume, he's not your typical you know uh, liberal socialist. You, you can't you can't use that against a guy that has a resume like this. So it it blunts some of that. They'll try, of course. But it, it helps when you have candidates that have this type of uh, background. Exactly. Uh, right. Like in 2018, the Democrats were very successful at this. They recruited women. They recruited women veterans. They recruited women national security experts like uh, Alyssa Slotkin, like right. uh, Spanberger in Virginia, in my hometown, Mike, in my home state, Mikey Slot Sherrill, Slotkin, New Jersey. Yeah, for sure. Like they, they mm -hmm. all were, they, yeah. they, they flipped Republican seats. Because they weren't what they thought, you know, your typical, they weren't AOC. Let's just say that. And they fit the district. So they're, you know, we're, it's good right. to see and, that. And, not, and look, there, there are a lot of seats up. There, there are a lot of seats up this year um, in a lot of places that where, where a Democratic military veteran will have certain credibility and substance to them that might not be there with somebody who's just a state legislator or Correct. somebody who's just a party apparatus person. That's right. Um, so I encourage the Democrats as and, and we're getting on towards the point where the serious candidates are, are in their races already. But in some other places and look, you've got Connor Land in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. a military veteran who's you know running for U.S. Senate. Um, and, and apparently he's going to be running against Dr. Oz <laughs> in the Republican side. Are you kidding me? Dr. Oz is getting in the Pennsylvania Senate race as a Republican. Mitch McConnell's having a bad day. I mean, first, it's. It's this idiot uh, running down there in Georgia, okay? Um, because he was a football player and black. They're like, oh yeah, oh, let's Herschel get this Walker. guy, Herschel Walker, right? Um, yeah, let's go get that guy. You want to talk about dumber than a doorknob? This guy can't put a sentence well, together, I mean, and, look, and he's a white I, I, beater I think, and, a, and a lunatic, completely unqualified. I think there are a lot of indications that Herschel Walker um, has serious mental illness. There are a yeah. lot of indications of that. You know, his talk about suicidal ideation and all these other things. Um, look, I, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no doctor. I'm no forensic psychologist, but as a campaign guy, um, you don't want a guy who says, yeah, I play Russian roulette. I'm challenging the system. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. He's, um, he's, but you, you know, know, look, it's very, very there, there are opportunities here. Sure. And, and there are opportunities here where a lot of these folks are not going to anticipate, um, you know, a Democrat having more credibility than they will on national security matters. And it's a, it's a, it's a good angle. Yes, it is. 
And another example, and this 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 candidate was is on our radar just simply from the outstanding opening uh, introdu introducing the candidate video. His his announcement video is absolutely outstanding. His name is Josh uh, Remillard. I think that's how you spell you pronounce it. Remillard. Yeah, yeah, Remillard. Yeah. Remillard. He's yeah. an army combat veteran. He's running against oh the other Nazi fetish guy. Madison Cawthorn down there in North Carolina's 11th district. And he was inspired to run after he saw Cawthorn win and the insurrection and his, his role in helping to incite it. Watch this sure. guy's campaign video. This, this, this is how you do it, folks. Outstanding. Yeah. Terrific. A rook. In the army, it's when you carry all your gear for miles on end. And it's that weight you carry that makes you stronger. In many ways... I've been on a ruck my entire life. I bounced around from foster home to foster home until my grandparents were able to adopt me when I was four years old. I grew up in Wilmington, worked every job you can imagine. Deckhand on a tugboat, bouncer, I even worked in a tattoo shop. But in 2006, I made a decision that changed my life. I joined the United States Army. I was a gunner on an armored Humvee. And over eight years and two deployments, when you get shot at and nearly blown up as much as my unit did, you make some really close friends. And Bryce was one of mine. When he got back from Afghanistan, he was battling PTSD in a bad way. He just wasn't the same. And we tried really hard to get him help. But one day his demons got the best of him and he took his own life. I stayed with him until his body was taken away. It's one of the most painful memories that I have. And it's that memory that came flooding back when I saw Madison Cawthorn up on that stage on January 6th. Wow, this crowd has some fight in it! Spewing lies and helping incite an insurrection against a nation I fought to defend and my buddies died for. That's the moment I decided to run for Congress. Because Madison Cawthorn doesn't give a damn about them. But the truth is, I'm not just running against him. I'm running against all the politicians that lied to us and got people killed that day because of it. Against the politicians that take a call from the CEO whenever their phone rings, but haven't listened to their constituents in years. Against all the politicians that sent us to war and didn't give a damn about our health when we came back. Look, people say a guy like me can't make it to Congress. I have tattoos. I don't sound like they do. I didn't go to an Ivy League school. And I sure don't know any rich people that can fund my campaign. But I know a traitor when I see one. And Madison Cawthorn is a traitor, a fraud, and a coward. So taking his seat in Congress, that's my new mission. The weight that I carry. And I know together, we can prove all the naysayers wrong. Let's go. Holy hell, that's a good ad. And yes. you know, I have a high bracket for good ads. It's <laughs> personal, it's narrative, it's a story, it's comparative. It is, and look, that 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 seat is in Western North Carolina in an area I know very, very well. And it has turned into a fairly masculinity game. It's the fake macho game. That guy, he's a real. Mm -hmm. tough guy he's a real soldier he's a real american hero whereas madison cawthorn punches trees and apparently <laughs> sometimes women um and he is he's a i mean madison cawthorn is a legitimate bad guy he's part of this yes. little this, this growing sort of neo alt-right you know wink and a nod at the nazi thing well i don't believe in nazism per se but they need to be punished you know this is a guy who is one of the most egregious uh oh the nazis must must have heard heard rick and cut his internet feed we'll we'll get him back um it's been a while since we had internet gremlins for rick wilson but to complete his thought about the madison cawthorns of the world you know these wannabes out here um this is taking over off throughout the republican party we have these guys that think that they're tough guys and and they they have these savior complexes and madison cawthorn for those who don't know he was very excited about visiting hitler's um vacation home you know eagles nest 
out there. He was he tweeted about this. And yes. so when I say this, these Nazi fetish uh, uh, sympathizers, you know, him and Marjorie Taylor Greene continue to make these very inappropriate comparisons to vaccine mandates as, you know, just like when the, you know, when the Jews and the Nazis with the yellow ribbons, like, stop it. Just stop it. They they are bad, horrible, awful people. And I, I wish Josh down there in, in the in North Carolina's 11th district, the the best. Uh, if, if his if that ad is any indication, yeah, that's going to that's going to be a hot. Prim- there's, that, yeah, that's going to be a hot primary down there. There are going to be a lot of a lot of good candidates. But uh, I think the, this is one of those lessons where a Democrat can offset some of the redness of that seat by having a military veteran like that front and center. Um, but again, there, there are a lot of good candidates in the primary down there. And and, you know, it's going to be one of those races where people really watch it because, you know, as I as I before I lost you guys there, Madison Cawthorn is a shitbird. He's a bad guy. He is somebody who who, you know, played a role in inciting that 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 attack that day. He's proud of it. He boasts yep. about it. Yep. And and of course, and once again, I don't want to go too far off the railroad tracks here, but if Kevin McCarthy had. Um, a pair of political testicles larger than a, uh, a grain of sand, he would take a person like Madison Cawthorn and kick the living shit out of him and say, son, shut the fuck up or the NRCC is going to find somebody else to run in that seat. That's enough. Mm-hmm. But of course he doesn't because he's living in terror of the fact that 60 or, or so of his members now believe in the Trump hobby MAGA cult rather than being in the Republican caucus. So here we are. Here we are. And you can add that to the long list of, of people that he should have said cut the shit to and and done something about, like Paul Gosar. We talked about that on Tuesday. Um, you know, he's done nothing about him, and yet he still has committee assignments. Right. Um, and Bobert and the rest and, and Cawthorn and these people who and they didn't do anything about Marjorie Taylor Greene either. It it was it took Nancy Pelosi to do it. It, it wasn't it wasn't Kevin McCarthy, but yet they want to go after, uh, you know, the Republicans who voted for infrastructure. It's it's really it's to, it's so frustrating. Um, but anywho, we'll continue to call them out for it. Um, right. Yes. Right. It, 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 Rick, are you we, we you're frozen in a in a uh, there we are. You're back. OK. <laughs> We're having some technical issues on my end right now. That's okay. That's all right. If you if you want to go and try to handle that, um, I will talk a little no, we'll, bit. About, we'll, you're let's, good. Let's let's, let's 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 take our chances. Okay. Well, um, we're going to talk a little January sixth in a minute, but I wanted to talk before we get to them. Um, oh, some another military uh, point of of appreciation um, here in D.C. I don't know if you if you've ever visited the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Have you ever had a chance to go? Many times. Okay. It um it's it's one of the most solemn beautiful ceremonies if you ever have a chance to come to DC and go and watch. Yeah, um what these the soldiers who are responsible for this they call them sentinels. It is one of the highest honors you can have in the military and the training they go through mm-hmm. is rigorous. I mean they, it takes them 8 hours to prepare their uniforms for the next day of work. Like it, it's unbelievable. I encourage people to um Google and research what these folks go through in order to uh become one of these sentinels and then what the routine is. But there's some history. Today is the 100th anniversary of the official dedication of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It opened uh to the public 100 years ago um under Warren Harding, I believe, in 1921. And in 1937, and I didn't know this, they, it wasn't until several years later that the 24-7, 365 days a year, no matter rain, shine, sleet, snow, hurricane, blizzard, um, protection, um, guarding of the tomb began. And that was after the fact that too many people were like picnicking around the tomb of the unknown soldier. And and they were like, yeah, we're going to have to put a stop to that. That's not okay. So in 1937... It became 24-7. And in that period of time, it wasn't until a few weeks ago that you had the first all-female sentinels and then changing of the guard, which is pretty outstanding how far we have come. What an honor. And the woman who is, she's known as the um, first woman to hold the position of sergeant of the guard. That's the person who inspects the, you know, inspects them and and does, she also does the the 21 um, uh, 
uh, steps march with them. Um, and that is something that is, her name is uh, First, Sergeant First Class Chelsea Porterfield. And there's some, you know, some little uh, trivia about this. Why do they march 21 steps? It says, what we do for our entire post, we take 21 steps across the mat, turn and face DC for 21 seconds, right. turn back, face down the mat, change shoulders and do that process over and over again. 21 alludes to the 21 gun salute, which is mm -hmm. the highest military honor. So we give them that salute as many times as we can during the hour or half hour we are on watch. So in the summer, it's for an hour. In the winter, it's a half an hour and they change. Right. That is really, really, really cool. I did not know that was the first time it was all female. So uh, girl power salute to them. And also, it's the first time that they've uh, allowed the public to lay flowers um, at the tomb. That was not allowed before, but they decided to open it up in, in for the hundredth anniversary. And you know, I think that that's that. It's, I'm glad to see that because that and so many people have been lining up to pay their respects this Veterans Day and and around now. And and I I just hope that we continue to honor our military and our fall in that way. You need to show that kind of reverence for the people who uh, fight for us every day. Like I always mm -hmm. like I said today, freedom isn't free. We right. enjoy all of these freedoms that we have and, and what we do because you have people like those in the military that are willing to volunteer and put their lives on the line so that we don't have to. Right. So there, that is our, that's my little history lesson of the day for Veterans Day, which I think is important. All right. Let's talk a little January 6th. Oh, Rick, you know, we were hoping to see that we would get some we'd get some documents tomorrow. Right. We had a judge right. rule that that the executive privilege didn't apply to Trump and there were supposed to be 700 documents released. And it looks like now there's been a delay. You know, look, th here's what Trump's trying to do. It's so frustrating. They they're trying to move this into the into the the, the circuit and then they're going to try to get it to the Supreme Court where he believes that his handpicked justices will be loyal to him. He may be right. I, I, I am not an expert on this sort of, 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 of esoteric you know, public information and executive privilege stuff, but I will say this. He is trying to run out the clock. This is why I was frustrated with the 1-6 committee when, they, when they've taken a soft approach on these things and they've taken the traditional Washington approach on these things. They already have a lot of these documents. They need to make them public. They need to push this out. They need to continue to keep the hammer down. And you know what? Steve Bannon, yes, they voted a contempt charge on Steve Bannon. And the Justice Department is, you know, percolating along. However fast or slow they're going to move, we don't know. But there are multiple other members of the Trump administration who are saying, doing the same extended middle finger to the committee and, the, and thus the American people. And the committee needs to hold them in contempt as well. Yes. Unless these people face criminal penalties and actual accountability, they will continue to play fuck around. They will continue to do what they're doing, which is to try to run out the clock. And I tweeted this this morning, and I mean this. If Steve Bannon, if Steve Bannon continues to walk free, every day he's free is a day closer to another violent attack to seek to overthrow the American government. He is a mastermind of this. He is a, he is a centerpiece of this. And he is a person through which there are multiple layers of connections iterating out into a whole bunch of different areas, including the Proud Boys, the Alt-Right, the mm -hmm. Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters. And a lot of those groups, sadly, have a high concentration of American veterans, and they're trying hard to recruit them and bring them into those groups yep, to subvert right. and suborn the oath they took and to, and to get them to adopt a twisted and dark view of what that oath really meant. They swore an oath to the Constitution, not to Donald Trump. They swore and, an oath to the Constitution, not to some idea of owning the libs or 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 causing or causing a ruckus or scaring the shit out of people. But here we are. You would never know it, as it nope. seems as though the oath to Donald Trump and to this MAGA Trumpism nonsense has uh, has overtaken their oath of off their oath to the Constitution, and not just them, but members of Congress too. 
people who who know better, anyone who's taken that yep. sworn that oath and taken that oath, uh, how many are not living up to that now? How how many of them have uh, <laughs> their their fealty to Donald Trump and and Trumpism has superseded their oath to their their oath of office? I've said this it's, many many times, and they demonstrate true, it every freaking it's day. True. It's disgraceful. Another thing that's disgraceful is Donald Trump still thinks he's president. And he's got people surrounding him that are enabling this, this, this charade. He puts out these press statements about, you know, from the president, 45th president of the United States. And well, you, you so, hear he's got Rick Grinnell over in Europe as his that's, envoy That's where I'm ambassador. going with this. That's I'm like, where I'm going with this. Get the fuck out of here. Come yeah, on. So, so for people who don't know, Rick Grinnell is another one of those people who had no business being anywhere near government, never mind being in the national intelligence. Uh, he was, you know, the, the DNI director there for a couple of minutes, which was a travesty. Uh, he was, I think, the uh, ambassador to Germany at one point. And now he, Trump put out this, this statement where he calls his, his envoy to Europe and Rick Grinnell's over there negotiating some things with like the Croatians or what? Or the what Kosovars. The, and, and, and look, <laughs> I, I can say this. Um, if Barack Obama had deployed people overseas and announced his envoy ambassadors were, were, were going to go and conduct diplomacy after he had left office, the Republican machine would have lost its damn oh. mind. Yes, he, there would be congressional hearings. There would be this. There would be a massive meltdown across the board, and, and it would have led to a complete, you know, twenty four seven. You know, is the Kenyan Muslim socialist sleeper agent trying to take over the world with Marxism? Right. It would be a complete crazy town visit. Yeah. And so, you know, but again, the double standard here that is that. It is a presumption on the part of Trump and the part of Trump supporters that Joe Biden is not our legitimate president and Donald Trump still is. This is, of course, a fantasy. This is, of course, ludicrous. But, you know, with the usual farrago of conspiracy theories, you know, bad ideas, Facebook takes yep. um, and, 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 and Trumpian an entire, bullshit. And yeah. an entire media ecosystem that backs Correct. this bullshit up. Correct. Here we are. Where there's, they seem to be perfectly fine with this because they don't acknowledge that Donald Trump is president. Meanwhile, we're still getting more and more reporting coming out from you know all different sources and and re reputable ones um, about about January sixth and about what was going on at the end of the Trump presidency. Um, we know that G former CIA director Gina Haspel, she told Mark Milley, and I think this was reported in the in the book Peril as well. She told Mark Milley after the uh, Secretary of Defense was ousted, ousted, Mark Esper. She said, "quote We are on the way to a right wing coup." More and more people, serious people, are using that term. So when we were using it, people thought we were being hyperbolic, and right. you know, uh, no, okay. Yeah. More and more people who were in the inside who watched this go on actually use that term too. So, you know, <laughs> that is scary stuff. Gina Haspel is, is in, was, has been in national security and deep into like CIA stuff for like 30 years. So right. she knows she's what the she's real talking deal. about. Absolutely. She's the real um, deal. Hey, Rick, we actually have a couple of, of social questions. Let's get to them. All right, let's do it. Yeah. What's our first question? Is the apparent struggle between McConnell and Trump a real thing? Oh, Rick, I know you it's got- It's not you, apparent. You... It's, it's, <laughs> it's as real as can be. And, and I will say this, I've written about this, talked about this a lot. One of our great gifts is to be able to get in the heads of bad people. We got in the head of Donald Trump several times this year already, telling him Mitch McConnell is cucking him, is owning him, <laughs> is making him look weak and small and embarrassed. We are trying to help Donald Trump understand that Mitch McConnell hates him, views him with utter contempt, and is trying to put his candidates who are going to be loyal only to McConnell into primaries to win. It's like Ohio. Right now you've got J.D. Vance and Josh Mandel who are both vying to be Trump's you know, special golden boy. And Mitch McConnell's candidate is a woman named Jane Timken. She's a moderate rhino, you know, Romney McCain Republican. I endorse Jane Timken for the Republican primary. Jane Timken should be the nominee. Play this video clip for yourselves, Magus, a number of times because Mitch McConnell is going to try to pick out people that are more electable. Donald Trump wants people who are loyal. We are trying to encourage that division. And, and Reza, all the time, we're splitting and splitting and splitting. We're always trying to put a wedge between those two. Um, and with McConnell, we're reminding him how perilous his control is. Mm -hmm. We're reminding him it doesn't take many more Republican senators who are utterly loyal to Donald Trump to put Tom Cotton or Josh Hawley 
in 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 the in the in the in the position of leader. And so, you know, McConnell is a very old creature of Washington. He's a he's a guy who has been around this process for so long and he has so much knowledge and so much power inside that system. But he is now, you know, it's it's the immovable force and the the, the immovable object meets the irresistible force. <laughs> and I have to say, I really think Trump's odds of overcoming McConnell's slate of candidates is pretty good. And I I, I did hear today, one of the reasons Sununu did not run mm. is he's worried that Corey Lewandowski is going to get in the U.S. Senate race and Trump would endorse him. And that would be that. And I think Corey <laughs> is a likely candidate for U.S. Senate unless he's, God, unless he's not a man enough to do it, unless he's too much of a... Is, unless he's too much of a weak ass to do it. I mean, Corey, you should run for U.S. Senate because we know you'll do anything to beat a woman. Oh, God. Rick. Rick. Yeah. I got that ad already written, Corey. It's oh, already in the here can, we go. bro. Here we go. <laughs> Listen, if anyone doesn't believe that our taunting of, of, of Trump and McConnell and that whole dynamic isn't working, all you have to do is look at the, the comments that Trump puts out about McConnell. I mean, he just went after him again about how he's not very smart and terrible because of the infrastructure bill. So um, it works. It's so it's easy. It's easy. These people are predictable. All right. We have another question. Happy Chipmunk. Can moderate Republicans ever regain control of the GOP? Uh, no, <laughs> not as long no. as right. Not as no. long as the leadership no. of the Republican Party continues to give Donald Trump a platform and continues to give his big lie legitimacy and continues to cower at the thought of Donald Trump, you know, uh, not fundraising or sending out a, a mean, can't be tweet anymore, a mean, uh, misspelled, right. grammatically incorrect statement against them. As long as they continue to do that, there is no chance in hell that moderate Republicans will ever be in control of the GOP. I know there are plenty of people out there who are looking at the Glenn Youngkin election in Virginia and have been are re-energized thinking that this is the Republican Party's chance to go back to normalcy. No, the hell it's not. Because you don't have a normal, sane person running the Republican Party. You have Donald Trump. And you're talk to McCarthy and talk to your leadership about the fact they're inviting Donald Trump to give the NRCC keynote speech. That tells you that Donald Trump is going yeah. to play a role in the midterms. He runs and the he's party going to run for president to again. And not, uh, uh, folks, I've said this till we're blue in the face. And Tara, give me a minute here. I just want to, I want to walk through a couple of things with some people. Go for it. Um, our mission at the Lincoln Project is because there's a team of people who care about preserving American democracy and the constitutional republic in which we live. And, and I'm so proud of that team every day and everybody on it. And I mean this from, from the most junior staffers to, to senior advisors like you, Tara. We are, we are honored to work with, and, with you guys every day in driving this mission forward. It is what we do. It is what we are committed to. It is what we have built. You know, we, we've staked our, as, as, as you might have heard this one before, our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honors on. And, and that mission has to go forward because uh, we understand and we live in reality. And reality is that Donald Trump controls the Republican Party and some very bad people like Steve Bannon control Donald Trump. We understand that, that we, we're not going to have many more elections if the dear leader is reelected. We understand that the rules they're making in the states are profoundly anti-small D democratic. And so the folks at the Lincoln Project, you know, we have punched hard for a year and a half now against the, 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 the worst of American politics. And, you know, we're going into the fall and into next year energized and, and our, our, our team is so strong. They are so good. And I mean that in every single department and division we have from political to social to comms to production, shout out to Michelle, um, to, to every other part, to fundraising, to digital, to, to, to the analytics stuff, to the politics stuff. We have a great team, and I just want to tell them all how privileged we are to work with them every day. And anyone who th tells you otherwise is a damn fool. Now, I will say this also. Tara, you are keeping some, some news under your hat during this whole show, and I have heard from the Twitter machine, that you are going to be on The View a number of times next week. 
I am. Yes, I uh, I am I love joining that. the ladies at the table of The View next Monday and Tuesday, and I'm thrilled to do it. Um, I've had the opportunity, the great honor of go guest hosting a few times in the past couple of years. Um, uh, and uh, it's, you know, they're they're looking for a conservative voice in that seat to, to replace Meghan McCain. And um, they've been auditioning lots of people. And um, so, you know, to be considered for for that opportunity again is, is really an honor. So I'm absolutely looking forward to it. I get to go to New York and, and hang out and they take great care of their their co-hosts up there. I, when I guest host. So it's a good time. And I, New York is the greatest city in the world. And I look forward to seeing Whoopi and Joy and Sunny and everyone and, and the hair and makeup team there is spectacular. So I can't wait to get glammed <laughs> up. Like that's the best part of the whole, the whole thing <laughs> is to get glammed up because, you know, it, you know, they're, they're the best up there. Shout out to Derek and Karen and, and, and uh, Lynette and, and, uh, but you know, a couple of the others up there, Rebecca, they're, they're just the best. So I'm looking forward to it. So Monday and Tuesday, I'll be on The View live at 11 on ABC. And guess who one of our guests is going to be? Tell me. Chris Christie. So uh... this is going to be fun. It's going to be the battle of the Jersey wit going on there. So, you know, you know, Chris Christie's going on a little uh, reputational rehab tour. Yeah, I, know, I noticed he's out poking at Donald Trump. But mm -hmm. it's going to be hard to unring that bell for Chris Christie, but we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. So I'm not sure if that's Monday or Tuesday. I think that's Monday, but um, definitely must must see TV. So and uh, must see TV also on Tuesday evening is uh, Rick will be with Dan Burkoff and they're going to be talking about uh, some of the stuff you were saying earlier about the role of extremism in the military and, right. and uh, the impact that's having. Dan is an extraordinary guy. He's a Navy SEAL surgeon. I mm -hmm. mean, <laughs> talk about overachiever. And um, he's from the Veterans for Responsible Leadership and he'll be joining Rick on, right. on Tuesday. So make sure you tune in for that show. And that is it for our show tonight. I'm signing off. And I will see you guys next week, but not Tuesday, because I'll be with the ladies in the view. <laughs> Enjoy. Have fun. Tune Thanks. in, everybody. We'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Ryan Wiggins with the Lincoln Project. And there's a lot going on we need to talk about. Trump's been hinting at a 2024 presidential run using the big lie that the 2020 election was stolen from him. And it's working. New polls show fewer Republicans are willing to hold the January 6th rioters criminally responsible. Meanwhile, GOP-controlled states are leading voter suppression campaigns nationwide. The Lincoln Project is working to neuter the current GOP-controlled government to ensure that future elections are fair and democratic and to put power back in the hands of the people where it belongs. But we can't do it without you. Go to lincolnproject.us slash donate to join in our long-term fight for democracy. We're honored to have you with us and we're not letting up.